Hi everyone, Ian here from the Media Center. And in today's video, I'll be showing you how to set up the iFootage NanoShark electronic slider. The NanoShark has a payload of around 3.5 kilograms when mounted on a table and 2.5 kilograms when on a tripod. The capacity is lower when on a tripod because of the additional extension which occurs as the slider moves from left to right and moves further away from its center mounting point. These weight capacities should handle any of our mirrorless and DSLR cameras, such as the Sony A7 series and Canon DSLRs. It's not recommended to use larger cinema cameras on this slider, such as the Canon Z70, Blackmagic 6K Pro and the Sony FS5 as these will produce a lot of micro jitters due to their payload. If you'd like to use these types of cameras, then we have a manual slider system available, which is designed for heavier weight capacities. Before turning on the slider, there's a couple of things to be aware of. First, in order to use the slider, you need to make sure that the upper carriage lock is unlocked. When this lock is disabled, you'll be able to move the slider freely and this will ensure no damage occurs to the motor. If you choose to use a slider on a table, you'll want to ensure that it's level and that no rocking or shaking can occur. The Nano has two adjustable feet and this will help ensure that it stays level and secure. A bubble level is present to ensure you can also achieve accurate leveling. Once the motor is unlocked, you'll want to check the upper carriage tightness. This is to ensure that your movements occur smoothly when the slider is operated. To do this, position the central base to the left-hand side of the motor so it's sitting flush with the control box. Wiggle the central base to see if any wobble occurs. If this happens, you'll need to adjust the carriage tightness until no movement occurs. To adjust the tightness mechanism, slide the roller to the left and this will disengage the teeth. You'll then be able to roll the dial forward and backward. Rolling to the plus symbol will increase the tightness and rolling toward the minus icon will loosen the tightness. Please note here, do not over tighten it as it could damage the mechanism. Once this has been done, move the base across to the right hand side and again repeat the same process. Check if any wobble is occurring and adjust the tightness if needed. Once these parameters have been checked, if you want to use a system with a tripod, you can mount the slider via one of its dedicated screw threads, which is situated on the lower carriage. If any heavy wobble occurs at the tripod mounting point, the lower carriage can also be tightened and loosened to ensure that it's secure. To do this, move the lower carriage to the furthest left-hand side, and once again, increase or decrease the tightness via the dedicated dials then repeat this process at the furthest right hand position. Before turning on the system, ensure the slider is free of debris and dust, as this could impact the smoothness and longevity of the system. If this is the case, use a rocket blower to remove any dirt. These are available in stores. The slider is primarily powered by Sony MPF batteries, which attach to the side of the unit, but it can also be powered by an external power bank via the USB-C port when longer recording times are needed. Now before the camera can be attached, the slider needs to go through an automated calibration process. If you're planning to use the slider on a table, calibrate it on a table. If you're planning to use it with a tripod, then place it onto the tripod before calibration begins. To turn on the system, press and hold the power button for three seconds. The iFootage logo will appear and the slider will begin its calibration process. At this stage, the slider should not be touched while the calibration process takes place. Once the calibration is finished, the camera can be attached and the slider screen will prompt you to ensure the camera is sitting in a right angle position, i.e. the camera should be facing forward. To mount the camera, you have two options. The first is that it can attach directly to the upper carriage base as this houses a quarter inch and three eighths screw and has an electronic pan axis built directly into the unit. The second is that you can connect the Komodo K5 video head onto the existing mounting point, which is the option I recommend. This will provide more flexibility for altering the tilt axis. 
To attach the K5 head or a camera directly to the carriage base, press the lock button inward and then spin the head or camera onto the mounting screw. Once this is secure, release the lock button and the carriage pan head will turn freely. To ensure the camera moves as smoothly as possible, you'll want to find and position the camera's center of gravity along the center of the slider. To find this, attach the video head's base plate to the camera, then place a cylindrical object underneath and roll it forward and backward until you're able to find an even balance point in which the camera does not fall forward or backward. Memorize or mark this point with some tape and ensure this area is sitting directly over the video head's central point. Once the camera has been installed and is sitting perpendicular to the slider, click calibrated on the screen and you should now be set up and ready to go. To control the slider, we can use either the control box on the slider itself or a dedicated app. So let's cover the control box first. On the main page, we have four tabs, quick start, time lapse, stop motion, and settings. In addition, we also have a battery icon and percentage indicator, as well as a Bluetooth icon, which will indicate app connectivity if this has been set up. In quick start mode, you can set dedicated keyframe points labeled as A and B. Underneath this, you have a duration adjustment for the keyframes, a swap function, which allows you to choose whether your motion begins at the A keyframe or B keyframe, a loop function, which allows the keyframes to automatically repeat themselves once the sequence ends, and the standby button, which takes the slider to its starting keyframe point. Note, when a keyframe point is not being set, do not try and slide the base plate along the slider. It should only ever be moved when setting a keyframe. Trying to move this base along the slider at any other point will potentially damage the belt and the mechanism. To select your first keyframe, press the power button and function button at the same time. The A and B keyframes will then begin to flash. As a side note, you can also get to this point by pressing the power and function button together when on the main homepage. At this point, you can now manually move the camera and slider position. Place the camera at its first keyframe point and press the A button or the function button. Next, move the slider to its second keyframe position and press the B keyframe or the function button again. On the screen, you'll be able to see a visual representation of where the two keyframe points are set on the slider. Once this is done, you can then select time. Within this window, you'll be able to select seconds, minutes, and hours. This will determine how long it will take the slider to move from keyframe A to keyframe B. You can choose this based on time or based on speed. Personally, I find time easier to use as I can pinpoint with more clarity when the start and end point will occur. Once these parameters have been set, press confirm. Once confirm has been selected, the loops function and start keyframe will become available. You can choose whether this motion begins from point A and moves to point B, or starts at point B and moves to point A. An arrow indicates how you have this set, and if loop is selected, the action will repeat itself indefinitely once the sequence has begun. When standby is stipulated, pressing the button will bring the keyframe sequence to its starting point and then start will be visible. When start is now pressed, the sequence will begin. To finish the sequence, press exit. To change keyframe points, press the power and function button at the same time, then move to new keyframe positions and use the touch screen to set a new A and B point. To delete keyframes entirely, press the power button and the function button at the same time, and then press the power button. In addition to the quick mode, you also have a time-lapse mode. Now, when using the time-lapse function, you'll need to use a camera which obviously has a photo mode. So something like a Sony a7 III, a7S III, or the Panasonic GH5. The camera will also need a dedicated cable connected to the slider, and these come supplied in the slider's bag and are labeled appropriately. 
the shutter cable will connect directly to the slider's base plate and the opposite side needs to connect to the camera's micro USB port. Now before going into the time lapse mode, you'll need to set your point A and point B from the quick start tab. Once your A and B point is set, press standby so the camera moves to the beginning of its sequence and then enter the time lapse mode. Interval means how much time is there between each photograph being taken. So for example, if I set my interval to five seconds, once the first picture is taken, there will be a five second interval before the second picture is taken, and then another five seconds before the third one, and so on. Now it's important to make sure that the interval is not shorter than the shutter speed of your camera. For example, if your interval is five seconds, you'll want to make sure your camera's shutter is under five seconds. If it were over five seconds, it would not have enough time to take the picture. This is especially important if you're doing longer shutter exposures for nighttime photography. In addition, if you're capturing extended periods of nighttime photography, for example, the movement of stars, then it's common to use the bulb function on your camera. If this is the case, you also have a bulb mode available on the slider, and this would allow your camera's shutter to be open for much longer periods. Below this, you also have FPS. This should be set to the frame rate that your time-lapse will be played back in on your editing system. For the UK, you'll be picking either 24, 25, or 50. But this will all depend on what your other footage has been captured at, individual preference, or if this is a standalone project. FPS means frame per second. So in this example, I've chosen 25. This means 25 individual frames will make up one second of footage. If I'd set this to 24, then 24 individual frames would make up one second of footage. The output time is where you choose how long you want the finished clip to be. So if I set my output time to 10 seconds and the frame rate is 25, because that's what I've set in my frame per second area, the camera would need to capture 25 individual frames 10 times over to produce a 10 second clip. If we calculate this, 25 times 10 means 250 frames will need to be captured to create the 10 seconds worth of footage. Within the settings page, you have two pages. On page two, you can adjust the screensaver time and the starting delay time of the movement. For example, if start delay is set to six seconds, this means when the start button is pressed for the movement to begin, there will be six seconds of no movement before the first keyframe begins. Page one of settings provides you with the language option, please keep this as English, and the firmware version. When a new firmware becomes available, we'll perform this in the media center. However, we may wait a few weeks to ensure that no major bugs are present, which could hinder the operation. In addition, you also have a motor setting and system calibration function. In the motor settings window, you can adjust the torque and response speed. If shake is occurring in the frame, then performing an auto tune will reevaluate these settings and make adjustments to try and resolve the micro jitters. I'd recommend doing an auto tune when you first set up the system and after the camera has been installed. I found the A7S performs well when it's pan and slider torque and response speed are within the 20 to 40 range. If any of the areas are set to zero, I found the slider performs horribly and produces a lot of micro jitters. Check this auto tune is set correctly every time you turn on the system. You can also restore the system from this location, which sets everything back to its default parameters. If this is done, it's recommended doing an auto tune again to set the correct torque and speed. To further reduce the possibility of micro jitters, it's recommended that the slider performs movements at 21 seconds or longer. Less than 21 seconds will increase the risk of jitters. Finally, using wider focal lengths of 24, 28, 35, and 50 mil will hide the camera shake more than 70 mil, 80 mil, and telephoto focal lengths. If the camera or lens has IBIS, then this can also be experimented with. Some people have found this produces good results, while others do not, so it's important to perform test shots before committing it to the production. 
Personally, I found it produces good results when performing movements which are slower than 20 seconds. The system calibration function performs a similar action to when you first turn on and set up the slider. This should be performed if the slider is performing erratically or incorrectly. To perform this calibration, the camera and additional K5 Komodo video head need to be removed before it's initiated, so make sure to do so. The iFootage also has an app which allows you to control many of its functionalities. This can be found in the Apple and Google Play Store under iFootage Mocker. When you first open the app, you may be asked if it can use your audio, camera and device location. These parameters are individual preference, however I'd recommend allowing them. Once done, you'll be taken to the home screen. Click connect and you'll then be able to enable the Bluetooth connectivity. Once this is done, the app should link to the slider and provide you with its battery percentage level as well as firmware information and tell you if any updates are available. Please do not perform these updates as this will be done by the Media Center Stores team. Click next and you'll be taken to a selection window where you can tell the app if you're shooting with a smartphone camera or a more traditional video camera. Select whichever is appropriate and you'll be taken to the app's main control window. For this video, I'll be selecting the more traditional video camera. Within this interface, you'll have access to a range of the slider's control functions. In the top center of the screen, you'll have a drop down which allows you to change between video, time lapse, and stop motion. Video is where you'll be performing your quick start keyframes. To the side of this drop down window, you'll have a Bluetooth icon where you can turn Bluetooth on and off, as well as an area to see your battery level and firmware information. On the opposite side is an LCD icon and when this is selected, the slider's LCD panel will go to sleep. In the center of the window, you have access to the slider and pan joysticks. These will allow you to move and alter the slider electronically, directly from the app. When using these joysticks, you cannot manually move the slider with your hands. The slider's base plate will be locked into position, so don't try to force any movement. Above the joysticks are the A and B keyframe points. These can be turned on and off by tapping the A and B letters. To set a keyframe, use the joysticks and move the camera to its first position, then press A on the app. Next move to the second keyframe position and press B. Once selected, the ready button will be enabled. Pressing this will move the slider back to its starting keyframe. To the side of the app, you can enable the loop function, the direction of travel, and preview the movement which has been set up. Along the bottom of the page, you can also adjust the time period of the movement, as well as how much delay will occur before the sequence begins. Once you're happy with all these areas, click ready, then start, and the movement will begin. If you want to move the slider by hand, in the same way you would when not using the app, you can enable the manual set key. Doing so will disable the app joysticks and the A and B keyframes will begin to flash. From here, you can now manually move the slider into position with your hands and tap the letters to confirm their new position. The time-lapse and stop motion window tabs work in the same way as the video page. And just like on the slider, these areas will provide different settings as they're designed for their specific use case. Hopefully you'll be able to create some fantastic content with this little slider. So thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, please come and see any of the technical staff in the resource area. And as always, until next time, keep shooting, keep being creative, and we'll see you soon.